worthy and it is so good to be back together worshiping the name of Jesus. He's the name above all names. And as we just sang, how great is our God. And I was just thinking earlier today, Psalm 19 came to mind and it says this, Psalm 19, one through four, the heavens declare the glory of God and the expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour out speech. Night after night, they communicate knowledge. There is no speech, there are no words, their voice is not heard. Their message has gone out to the whole earth and their words to the ends of the world. And y'all, God is the God of the creation, the one who reveals himself to us through everything. And what I know to be true is that God wants to reveal himself to you tonight, to me tonight, to us tonight. And so we're gonna get to do that by the reading of God's word and the studying of God's word as we continue worshiping God through studying the Bible. So I've invited my two friends up here and they're gonna introduce themselves and we're gonna read the word of God and we're gonna do it together. Hi everyone, my name is Lana Kalibuso Kui. I'm on the Aggie Women's Golf Team. <laughs> I'm Jenny, I'm also on the Women's Golf Team, class of 23. So the scripture we'll be reading today is Luke 19, 45 to 48, and it goes, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do for all the people were hanging on his words. Breakaway, this is the word of God for us, the people of God, thanks be to God. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Oh man. Well, howdy! Man, if you're excited to be in Rudder tonight, we make a little bit of noise, just a little bit. If you're, if you're excited, if you're excited to be declaring the glory of God at the epicenter of the largest university in the United States of America, would you make a little bit of noise tonight? I have to admit, I was not ready. I was not ready. Man, you guys turned out and gosh, y'all sound beautiful tonight. I hope you know that. Uh, you look rested, amen, for spring break, and you sound beautiful. Uh, with that being said, we're going to open up the Bible. Uh, the ladies did a great job of getting us in there. Luke chapter 19, second half of Luke chapter 19 is where we'll be uh, if you have a Bible. And on a night like tonight, I just feel compelled to put out a couple different extra welcomes. Uh, some of you, I believe, uh, just stepped out of a meeting in Rudder Tower, or you were at a meeting room in the MSC, and you're like, ah, why not? Someone invited me, or you heard the commotion. I believe there are people in this room who believe they randomly walked in tonight, and I just want you to know it is anything but random. First of all, welcome home. We're so glad you're here, and secondly, just know the God of the universe who loves you ferociously felt it was time to have this moment with you, and I just pray that that meets you exactly where you are fills you with expectation, uh, it's gonna be a great night. Uh, Luke chapter 19, if you got a Bible, if you don't have one, don't even sweat it, we'll have the verses behind me. Everything is gonna be great. 1930 is where I'm starting tonight. 1930 in rural Northwest Tasmania. Anybody representing Northwest Tasmania tonight? Anybody at all? Okay, I hear you, I hear you. <laughs> you lie in front of God and all these people, okay. <laughs> Rural Tasmania, 1930, a hunter shoots and kills a wild thylacine. It's a Tasmanian tiger, if you are not a zoology major. It is a dog-like carnivorous marsupial, if you're curious. Very interesting looking animal, stripes across its back, very, very peculiar. At first glance, this is an insignificant story, completely insignificant, as this exact thing happened thousands and thousands of times, a hunter shooting one of these particular animals, but at second glance, it is a very significant little anecdote, as this animal was never seen in the wild ever again. Uh, just six years later, the last captive thylacine died in a Hobart zoo, extinct, gone, forever. Now, the crazy thing about this story, beyond just the tragedy of extinction, is that Tasmania's government had declared the thylacine a protected species. But that declaration was made official two months before the animals no longer even existed. As, research, as a researcher put it, 
the species was totally protected for the last 59 days of its existence. The government of this country knew that there was a decision to make. For years, they were aware, but they were caught between two voices. One was the voice of researchers desperately trying to protect the species. The other was the voice of ranchers desperately trying to protect their livestock and their pocketbooks. You see, there was a myth. One voice was that the thylacine was the foremost hunter of sheep in Tasmania. There was very little data to back it up, but their voice was loud all the same, leading the government to be stuck between two voices and experience just a tragic case of decision paralysis. Just knowing there's a decision to be made and not actually having the constitution to go through with it. Was the decision eventually made? Yes, absolutely, and technically, but the very definition of too little, too late. And although the government feared the cost of making a decision, there was a real cost in not making one as well. My friends, as we fast forward to AD 33 in Jerusalem, as we continue our study of the last week of Jesus's life, a crowd will be caught between two voices and forced to choose. And as we jump forward another two millennia to that, from that to this moment in this beautiful room with these people, another crowd will be forced to make some decisions as well. The week that changed the world. The last time we met together, we devoted our time to the arrival of Jesus in the city of Jerusalem on what Christians call Palm Sunday for what would prove to be the last days of his life. That was the day he showed up to fulfill his destiny, fulfill his master plan to secure our rescue, mine and yours. And the phrase that summarizes the essence of the scene that we studied last time on Palm Sunday was what was shouted by those crowds who welcomed him that day. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, this word that means come, save now, we pray. But if you're familiar with the story of Christ's final week at all, you know that in just a few short days time, the same crowd that cried out Hosanna will cry out, crucify him. And they will cry it out persistently until a Roman governor grants that request. And so my friends, there's two questions tonight. One is a biblical question to understand the biblical story. Another one is a practical question, which we will get to. The biblical question is this, just to understand the narrative of what's happening. Given Sunday, why Friday? Given a crowd saying, we praise you, we welcome you, Hosanna, welcome to the king. Why on Friday is that same crowd saying, crucify him? My friends, the answer is Monday and Tuesday. Monday and Tuesday of what's called Passion Week or Holy Week, the last week of Jesus' life, often gets skimmed through when being studied or preached or even just understood by Christians around the world. Sunday, Palm Sunday, was all about the presentation of the Messiah, Jesus presenting himself as the coming rescuing king, as your king and your rescuer and your savior, whether you've recognized that or not yet. But Monday and Tuesday, they were all about the proclamation of the Messiah. The words he proclaimed. Sunday was all about the welcome of the king. Monday and Tuesday are all about the words of the king. And the way those words will move the crowd in the book and the crowd in this room toward high stakes decisions. Who will you trust? Who will you believe? Who will you follow? We're gonna continue following Jesus through his final days into the temple, into public debate, and ultimately right up to the point of decision. And my friends, the decision you face might be one of the most important ones you ever encounter. And amen to that for a God who brings us face to face with such moments. Would you bow your heads? We're gonna pray. And friends, would you do what we do every week here at Breakaway? Would you start by praying a simple, clumsy prayer for yourself <laughs> in all sincerity? Holy Spirit, would you speak to me through the word of God? 
And secondly, friends, would you pray a similar brief prayer for the people to your left and to your right, in front of you and behind you? God, would you speak to them? And lastly, friends, just in humility, would you pray a quick prayer for me that God would just help me handle the word of God faithfully? Holy Spirit, we believe that where two or three of us are gathered in your name, you are there with us. Thank you for bringing our praise to life. Would you now bring the book that cannot lie to life? May the truth within it leap off the page into our hearts, force us into the decisions that we need to make. And may we make them faithfully. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said together, amen. Monday, March 30th, 33 AD. This is Luke chapter 19, verses 45 and 46, which we just read. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer but you have made it a den of robbers. Welcome to the temple, breakaway. Welcome to the temple. We have two pictures. The first one I wanna show you is a 3D rendering of what the temple complex likely looked like at that time. Overwhelming. I don't have time to fully nerd out. How about this for a technical observation? That sucker's big, all right? It's big, 36 acres built by King Herod to handle millions of people at a time. And some speculate it did sometimes, more specifically, it would sometimes at this exact week, the week leading up to the Feast of the Passover, most important day on the Jewish calendar of the year. It would happen then. Some say that the the city would swell 300, 400 plus thousand people with religious pilgrims coming for this exact week. This place is the epicenter of Jewish life. Its original purpose, just briefly stated, was a place to be close to God. A place to be close to God. That was its divine intent initially, a place to pray, a place to gather, a place to offer sacrifices for sin and to remember the one who would come and be the ultimate once for all time sacrifice for sin. All those things are what the temple was initially made for. Uh, It was designed for a couple of different purposes. One, to serve those specific purposes, sacrifice, prayer. But the second picture uh, briefly just shows you some of the different courts within that temple. Um, you can see that there's the holiest of holies at the inner place. That's like what was said, the, the very presence of God dwelt. And only a chief priest could go there once a year. You go a little bit out from that, there's priests receiving sacrifices and ministering to the temple. You go a little bit out from that. It's where the Jewish men would bring their sacrifices on behalf of themselves and their households. Then there was a court for women. Then there was a court even for Gentiles considered to be the religious outsiders. Even they were considered like, we want you to have a place to pray and be near to this God who has a plan for all nations and all peoples. Incredible intentionality in that space. But I want to draw your attention to the court of the Gentiles, which was one of the outer courts. It had become a bazaar. It had become like a, this, this marketplace, no longer a place for the nations to come and pray, but rather a place for the exploited to come and pay. Speaking of exploiting, I'd like to introduce you to the Sadducees. You need to know who these people are to understand the temple and to understand where Luke is taking us in this passage. The Sadducees were the religious leaders uh, that didn't even really believe in the religion, which is kind of strange. But the temple is their territory, all right? The other words you've probably heard in regard to the Jewish leaders of the time were the Pharisees. Pharisees were the examples of faithful life Um, out there among the common people, synagogue to synagogue, which was small Jewish community to small Jewish community. That was the Pharisees' territory. And as this Jesus is rising up and teaching with authority no one's ever seen before and healing with authority that no one's ever seen before and doing miracles in ways no one ever seen before, he's taking influence away from the Pharisees with the common folk way out there. And the Pharisees were likely sending letters and making requests to the Sadducees at the mothership, at the temple, saying, guys, little help out here. This random Nazarene teacher is taking all of our influence, is disregarding things that we've said are just as important as God's word. 
little help here. And the Sadducees at the temple have spent all this time like, nah, your, your problem, not ours. Your problem, not ours. That's gonna change a lot these next few verses when we see where Jesus goes and what he does. You see, the Sadducees were a peculiar bunch. They didn't believe in the supernatural. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in eternal life. They believed that the soul died with the body. And so the question has to be, so why do they still care about being at the center of and at the top of Jewish religious life? There's an answer to that question. (laughs) Money and power. They have figured out ways to use this ancient religion to pad their pocketbooks, to pad their pockets. There were two specific hustles that they were running in the court of the Gentiles in the greater temple complex. And it was taking advantage of the sincere pilgrims coming to participate in God's festivals and offering sacrifices. One, the first hustle, you had to bring a lamb to sacrifice for the covering of sin uh, on behalf of yourself and your household. The only lambs that would be accepted were lambs considered without blemish. Guess who got to decide if they were without blemish or not? These folks, the religious leaders inside the temple. And so when that happened, you, you know, you would say you come and you've just saved up money and brought one of your prized animals or bought an animal from somebody else and you bring it into the temple, you've traveled with it, you've brought it, you've checked it, you think it meets the standards, you bring it up to this religious leader in the temple And they say, sorry, your sheep is not without blemish, but I'll take your sheep. And for an additional fee, you can buy one of my sheep that's without blemish. And you would say, it doesn't seem fair, but I'll I'll do it. I got no other choices, right? And so that takes place. And you're like, well, here, I'll I'll pay. And like, oh, I'm sorry, your Greek or your Roman money is no good here. This is the second hustle. You're going to have to use the, the Jewish currency that we believe is acceptable to God. And I tell you what, the exchange rate is not kind. So there's this double hustle and these Sadducees who don't even believe in the supernatural are hustling tens of thousands of people a day in the most despicable of ways. That is what's taking place. And they have set up all their power and all their wealth and all their rackets and all their side hustle at the epicenter of what should have been the epicenter of worship. I think God might have some feelings about this. But they've set it up. They have all the power, unquestionable. They're giving kickbacks to, you know, the the Roman officials and all this stuff. That's what's taking place. So imagine what their reaction is when Jesus does this. Check out this painting. Okay. (laughs) Um, I would like to point out a couple things. Uh, I don't think Jesus had an actual halo. I think he had a lot more melanin than that. That's just my personal opinion. Um, (laughs) but it's still helpful. Um, The reason that I actually appreciate this particular painting is that it shows Jesus with what? Do you know what he's holding there? Say it out loud. That's a whip. The Prince of Peace has a whip. That's one of my favorite little details in the Bible. Like there's a good, Jesus cleansed the temple on two different occasions. One was really in early in his ministry. One was this instance, very, very late in his ministry, last couple of days. I, I don't know that he had a whip this particular time, but there is an account in the gospel of John where Jesus walks into the temple and sees the hustling going on and sees the blasphemy and sees his people, his children pushed away in their poverty instead of brought near to be close to the nearness of God. And I want to say he snaps But if you take the time to go braid together a leather whip, which the scriptures say he did, you're thinking that through. Like, I'm gonna get these dudes. Like, (laughs) this is not impulsive. This is not reactionary. And then he's like, everybody out. Like, is that the Jesus you've got in your mind? Not mine. But that's some kind of scene of what happens. We put the gospel accounts together and this is what takes place. Jesus clears out the temple. He clears it out. It says in one of the gospel accounts that no one could even move a livestock animal from one side to another. Like he somehow takes control, not military control, but almost like supernatural divine control, shuts down the broken swindling system of the temple and he occupies it for two days, Monday and Tuesday 
clears out and cleanses the temple and then occupies the temple in the most crowded few days in Jerusalem of the year. It leads to the following dynamic in chapter 19, verse 47, 48. It says he was teaching daily in the temple. This is kind of a summary statement of this part of Jesus' story. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, just for clarity, but they did not find anything they could do for all the people were hanging on his words. So even at this point, all right, even at this point, the, the people who were saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even here in the summary statement are still hanging on his words, appear to be at least somewhat on team Jesus. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. So the people are still in this place of awe as Monday comes to a close. Tuesday, March 31st, 33 AD. Primary thing I want to highlight that happens here that Luke shows us, we got to do this quickly, is a three-round showdown between Jesus and those crooked religious leaders. Those leaders are not giving up their power and their money easily. And what I want, as I set the scene of what is about, what's about to happen, the showdown is a debate. In this culture, some of the highest form of entertainment and some of the high, it is public debate and some of the highest form of shame is to be bested in public debate. And I've tried to think of examples of what this would, the, the tone of it, like thousands and thousands of people all crammed into the temple complex with this Jesus who's taken over, holding court, and now he's gonna be going head to head with the religious leaders. It would have had all the electricity of like a playground basketball game at Rucker Park in downtown New York. Like it would have been just like electric, like, oh my gosh, them versus them. And the moment of you besting someone in debate is like someone dunking on your head. It's kind of like that. It's like that bone crushing hit like to keep someone out of the end zone in Kyle Field and the entire student section just goes, oh my God, right? Like that moment, that's what's happening here. It's that kind of vibe. So ding, ding, round one, Luke chapter 20. I'm gonna read this one and summarize the others. It says, one day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, Tell us by what authority you do these things. Or who is it that gave you this authority? So they are going like frontal attack. You don't have the authority to be here, right? That's their instinctive first move. I will, spoiler, it does not go well for them. Uh, verse three, he answered them. I'll answer your question, uh, but let me ask you a question first. Tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or was it from man? He's referring to John the Baptist, who is a very popular figure with those people who are surrounding them, thousands of people deep on all sides. What do you think, guys? Like, what do you think? Uh, and they were saying to themselves, oh boy, if we say that John was from heaven, Jesus is gonna say, well, then why didn't you believe him when he said that, you know, Jesus was coming and repent, get your heart right. But then they also say to themselves, what if we say John the Baptist is for man, all the people are going to stone us to death because they're convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Alleyoop, slam dunk. Okay. <laughs> That's what just took place. Round two, round two. This is Luke 20, 19 and 26. I'll summarize this one. The full frontal attack did not go well. They got laid out. They got dunked on. And so they decided to send spies, I, I, which is interesting to me. Uh, will you go act like, just see if you can figure this out. They send some, try to trap him with a question is what they tell the spies. And the question that the spies bring to Jesus, which is adorable, um, is, hey, should we pay taxes to Caesar? This is the religious leader's attempt to trap him the way that he had just trapped them. Ask a question where either way you answer it, we get what we want. Their angle is this, that if Jesus says, yes, you should pay taxes to Caesar, that he would lo lose the crowd. The crowd, believe it or not, not excited about paying a lot of taxes. This is Texas. You should probably whoop that or something. You don't probably love your, yeah, there you go. Um, they didn't really love paying taxes that much, right? 
And so like, well, we can't say, yes, we should pay. If he says yes, he'll lose the crowd. But if he says no, if he says no, you shouldn't pay to, to Caesar. Then we, the religious leaders, we can take that to the Romans and we can say, hey, we got a dude who's trying to like start a riot and he's saying that the people shouldn't pay you anymore. So they're like, either way he answers, we got him. And so then Jesus says, huh, interesting. Can someone get out like a Roman denarius, the coin that you're supposed to pay your taxes with? And they get one out and he's like, whose picture is on that? And they say, Caesar's. And Jesus says, oh, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but give to God what is God's. Okay, <laughs> that's what's happening here. That's what's happening. Again, crowd goes wild. That was a judo move. That was an absolute judo move. This is where there's funny things in the Bible. You got to pay attention. Look at verse 26. It says, they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said, but marveling at his answer, they became silent. Okay. They're just like, uh, we got nothing else to say. Round three, round three. This one is from the Sadducees themselves. They decide, okay, we obviously got to do this our, ourselves. Uh, the spies got dunked on. So they go themselves. They ask an elaborate, ridiculous question about a married couple and the man dies. And then so the woman is going to get married, is like going to be married off to his brother. And then it happens like six or seven more times. In the resurrection, whose wife will she be? I'm like, this is not really deep or realistic theology, but that's the angle they go. And Jesus finds a way to answer it. One, by giving them good theology about eternal life and marriage. And then number two, by completely calling them out for the fact they don't even believe in the resurrection and everybody knows it. So that's not only getting dunked on, that's just flat out like making fun of them. Like the, Jesus is not gonna be hustled. So this is where it gets even funnier. 39 and 40, then some of the scribes answered, uh, teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared to ask him any more questions. Game, set, match, crowd goes wild, all right? Those are the three rounds and how they go down. Here's the quick question though, for clarity. Why can't the Sadducees stand Jesus? Okay, there's, there's two things I wanna clarify. The answer is he's an immediate, obvious threat to their beliefs and to their comfort. He's an immediate, obvious threat to their beliefs and to their comfort. Their beliefs, they don't believe in the resurrection. Uh, they don't believe in eternal life. They don't believe in all, the supernatural, all this stuff. He is a threat just by walking, being, healing, by who he is and what he does. And then their comfort, their money, their power, their influence, their connections. He is a threat to all those things. But our question that guides the evening still remains, doesn't it? Because the question we led with was given Sunday, why Friday? We still don't have our answer to how does crown him king become crucify him? We've got reasons why the leaders want him dead, but what's happening on Monday and Tuesday to sway the crowd? Because as far as we can tell, they're hanging on every word. They're appreciating the fact that they're not being exploited that particular day. They're enjoying the show. Here's the answer. He is forcing them to make a decision. You with them or are you with me? He's not just besting those leaders in public debate. He's condemning them. You go forward a couple of verses in 45 to 47. It says, in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, but in the hearing of the thousands, beware of the scribes. Beware of these religious leaders in the temple who like to walk around in long robes and love meetings in the marketplaces and best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers. They shall receive the greater condemnation. Dang. He's revealing the hypocrisy and the heresy of the leaders the people were following. He's revealing the heresy, the false belief, and the hypocrisy, the hollow performance, the show of it all, of the voices that the people en masse were following and trusting. And he said, if you're with them, you're not with me. My friends, here's the thing you need to know, is that Jesus often tests allegiance 
by speaking hard words that will cost dearly if you obey them. Jesus often tests allegiance by speaking hard words that will cost dearly if you obey them. The crowd follows until it costs something. But my friends, discipleship starts when it costs something. If it hasn't cost you anything yet, you might need to question if you're actually following. It's going to cost. It's going to cost something. Can you feel Jesus getting in your grill a little bit? It's because he loves you. So friends, Tuesday draws to a close. The crowd disperses. It tells us that every night he was going back to Bethany, staying with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, this place of safety each night to rest. And as the crowd is dispersing, the following things are happening. Imagine it. The spectacle of the triumphal entry feels so far in the past tense. And it's only a couple days ago, but a lot has happened. The adrenaline of the debate showdown and the slam dunks on the religious leaders is now gone. But the words of Jesus are echoing in their ears. And as those words echo, the perceived cost of actually following him is growing. Man, if I follow this Jesus, I mean, I've heard about the healing and I've heard about the feeding of the 5,000 and I even heard he rose Lazarus from the grave a week or two ago. And I've heard the things he says about himself. I've heard all this stuff and I see that he might be the one we've been waiting for for centuries. I see it, I hear it, but man, the cost. Man, the cost. If I follow him, I'm not following those Pharisees that know my family back where I'm from, and I'm laying down all the culture of my family from centuries and centuries past, and I'm laying down all my connections. I'm gonna be rejected by these people in the marketplace. I'm gonna struggle economically, and then going down the line. Oh, there's cost. The cost is growing in the crowd's ear. As sun goes down on Tuesday afternoon, Tuesday evening, all the way through Wednesday, through Thursday. Because Jesus won't go back to the temple on Wednesday. Scripture's oddly silent that day. Thursday, everybody's observing Passover. And we won't see this crowd again until it's Friday. And they're standing outside Pontius Pilate's residents screaming for his murder. Because, oh yes, my friends, on Friday, this crowd will choose. This crowd will choose. They will lift up their voices with those same leaders Jesus warned them about. And they will say, crucify him. And if that is not enough of a choice, clearly their choice has been made. Is it me or is it them? They will make another tragic decision. Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, is going to put forward a proven insurrectionist and criminal named Barabbas who's been locked up. And in Pilate's attempt to get Jesus acquitted by the people because he's clearly done nothing wrong, he says, do you want Jesus who is the Christ, who I've beaten and humiliated, clearly not a problem, or would you want Barabbas? And they say, give us Barabbas. That's our choice They choose the one who is a threat to their safety over this Jesus who is a threat to their comfort. And you say, that's irrational. And I say, we all do it all the time. Every time, every time we knowingly choose to live or choose contrary to the ways Jesus has prescribed to us out of love, We are walking headlong into emotional harm, physical harm, psychological harm for ourselves and others. And we know it. And we know that that's true. We do the exact same thing. We do the same thing. And my friends, here's what's wild. Is that a Tuesday at breakaway can play out like this week plays out over seven days. We come into Rudder Auditorium. 
Jesus has promised to come near through his spirit if two or three of us gather. So Jesus draws near like Jesus drew near to Jerusalem at the triumphal entry. We praise him with song. We praise him with hands lifted high. The book opens and gradually our praise of him is tested by the call to believe and act contrary to how we have been believing and acting before we came in. And a moment of choice or decision arrives inevitably. And we don't even have to yell crucify him to make our choice. We can just file out, put our AirPods in, get back to the grind, knowing that we can wait until we forget and be off the hook. Friends, in our fear of what it would cost to make a decision, we choose to keep a safe distance from Jesus and his people. And I just need you to know, friends, being a safe distance from Jesus is anything but safe. No such thing. The ground in that place that's a safe distance from Jesus is like quicksand. The longer you stay, the deeper you sink, whether you realize it or not. And getting free and getting out gets all the more difficult. So right now, what's happening in this moment, 2024, springtime, Rudder Auditorium, is Jesus is pointing at the voices that have been leading you away from him. And he's saying, them or me? Them or me? He's pointing at the voices, so-called Christian or otherwise, that are saying, when it comes to your salvation and you're standing before God, earn it. He's pointing at the hypocritical voices that are saying, just fake it. He's pointing at the voices who are saying, trust us with your dreams, trust us with your goals, trust us with your sexuality, trust us with your community, trust us with your life, trust us with your eternity. And he's saying, daughter, son, them or me, how will you choose? And this is perhaps the most important question in this moment that is pregnant with meaning and difficulty and weight, I get it. The question is this, why? Why does Jesus arrange moments like these to make you choose? They're heavy. Why does he do it this way from time to time? And the answer, my friends, is that he loves you. He loves you. He loves you and he wants you free and healed and joyful and home with him. And that means indecision, he declares war on indecision because it keeps you locked up, unwell, anxious, and alone. And he's not having that. He's too committed to you. He refuses to let you settle in this place of indecision. Am I all in or not? I even believe he is who he says he is, but uh, I don't want to let go of that. I don't want to let go of them, but I'm just going to hang out in this place of indecision. Jesus steps into those moments, steps into this moment and says, I will not settle for that. I'm sorry, but I love you too much. It's time to choose, says Jesus. It's time to choose. Brothers or sisters, he's asking me or them. And he's saying, will you trust me? Will you trust me in this moment of decision? Let's pray. I'm just going to take the liberty and just pray a simple prayer of come Holy Spirit. We know you've been with us through the singing and through the book. Would you be with us just a few moments longer? Holy Spirit, would you give us ears to hear what you want to whisper to us? And Holy Spirit, would you just, even now, I, just through the authority we have in Jesus and just through the power of the Spirit, God, we just silence every voice that is not your voice in this place. 
the voices that are already trying to create excuses, the voices that are already trying to create distraction, the voices that are already trying to say things like, oh, just take your time. No, don't make any rash decisions. The voices that are saying, yeah, the Jesus stuff's not for you. The voices that are saying, nah, you're too far gone. The voices that are saying, nah, you found a way to out sin the grace of Jesus. The voices that are saying, you've waited too long. Lord, all of those voices are garbage and lies and we just silence them. And instead, Holy Spirit, would you just speak precisely what my brothers and sisters need to hear in this moment? Would you speak words of adoption over those who feel like orphans? Would you speak words of healing over those who feel too broken by what they've done or what's been done to them? Would you speak words of peace over those who are certain they're never going to get over their anxiety? Would you speak words of freedom over those who are certain they'll never be free of their slavery, whatever that looks like? And God, may the simplicity of the story just bounce off the walls of this theater that you have come for us. You drew near for us. You came to earth and you came to Jerusalem all because you were coming to rescue us. You, you came, you lived the perfect life we could never live, free of sin. You died the death that we deserved in our place because you love us. And God, you rose to new life. That's the incredible ending of this week in this story. So we can have new life as well. May the simplicity of that story, gosh, stick to every heart in this room. And my friends, I'm gonna give you an opportunity in this moment. And, and first I'm gonna say, if you've, if you've never chosen to trust the words of Jesus over the words of every other voice we've already just called out, if you've never chosen to trust Jesus with your everything and you want to do that right now, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand. I'm just gonna count down from three and just as a sign of faith and boldness, just raise your hand. Three, two, one, raise your hand. If that's you, I've never trusted Jesus. This is my moment, Rudder Auditorium, this spring, this is what I'm doing. I don't want to stand in indecision anymore. Just raise your hand if that's you. Amazing, incredible, you can put that down. And then my friends, and I believe beyond the few, I believe there's likely many of you in this boat. If God has brought something specific to mind, a specific part of your life, a specific area where other voices have been trying to keep you from him and you're ready to stop listening to those voices and to say, I choose you over them. Whatever that situation might be that the Holy Spirit's bringing to mind or that relationship that's coming to mind, if God's putting something specific on your mind and saying, will you choose me? And you just want to say yes, Three, two, one, put your hand in the air. There's something specific. This is a moment I want to remember and I'm willing to solidify it with a hand in the air. Absolutely incredible, incredible. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would do something beautiful and just solidify and make permanent these declarations. I pray God that voices of opposition that were loud would now sound silent in the ears of those who've been oppressed by them. And Holy Spirit, we pray that your voice, your gospel truth, Jesus, your incredible reassurance and declarations would be ringing back and forth in the ears of those who choose to trust you on this evening. Thank you that you showed up for us. Thank you that when we need it, you force us into decision because you love us. We give you all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said together, amen.